Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's LinkedIn Live audio event. Um, in the process of pulling folks up onto stage, there's Helen. I've already got Heather up on stage with me. Uh, I see Kanda there. Go ahead and raise your hand. You as well, Phil. Let me know when you guys are, are ready to join in. Um, as a quick note for everybody that is listening in, um, if you're new to the if you're new to the LinkedIn Live audio events, um, you'll see there's no chat, right? It's basically just those of us up on stage speaking. Um, uh, you have a couple of options. You've got some react emojis. Love to see those hand claps and hearts and, and all of that going on. Um, so go ahead and, and do that with us if we go. I am gonna record just a screen grab and the audio associated with this conversation that gives us the opportunity to not only go back and listen ourselves a little bit more closely later on, but also gives me the option to share with other people who couldn't be here live. Um, so just a disclaimer there. So as we get started, a little bit of an intro for today's session. This is part of my supplier diversity discussions LinkedIn Accelerator project. It's a 10 week project that goes through March 18th of this year. And each week has a different theme. This week is a really important one because we've kind of gone through the basics of what is supplier diversity, why do companies invest in it, what do suppliers expect from it, the importance of articulating a why behind the program. And then last week, we focused specifically on the dynamic created when you have large corporations but small suppliers working together. This week, however, we pause to take on what I'm calling the two not so secrets, and we're audio only, so I'm giving you air quotes for the full effect, the two not so secrets, as well as the big worry. Um, I ran a poll trying to figure out what other people's big worry is, but just to catch you up, if you haven't read any of the other content, the two big secrets are, one, that for corporations, most of what actually happens inside supplier diversity programs is more of a box check than it is necessarily driving meaningful change. The second not so secret is that most of the certified diverse business owners would have been successful no matter what without that certification and that they are using the certification as a differentiator as opposed to some certified suppliers that are using it as really a source of leads and business growth. Um, and, and from what I've heard, that doesn't tend to be as effective. Now, the big worry, and this is where we get to our topic for today, the big worry is what happens if we don't address the two not so secrets? My personal perspective is that either there's going to be negative brand damage associated with companies who you know, go through these box checking exercises and people catch on to it and, and call them out. That's a significant concern. The other is, you know, there's other things going on, right? There's inflationary pressures, there are supply chain disruptions. And so people may potentially say, you know what, this is something nice, again, with my air quotes, it's something we want to do, but truthfully, we're gonna have to shelve it. And so that's a concern as well. Um, now, the poll that I ran asked people uh, to share their opinion on the greatest threat to the potential success of the supplier diversity movement is, and they had four choices. Companies just checking the box came in at 70%. Supplier diversity managers can't systematize their passion came in at 14%. It could be viewed or treated as a fad, also came in at 14%. And then finally, with 3% supplier over-reliance on their certifications to build and grow their business. Uh, so to join me in this conversation, I actually have four folks up on stage with me today. I have Philip Eidson, Founder and Managing Director at Art of Procurement. I have Helen McKenzie, Head of Community and Events at Art of Procurement. Kanda Rozier, president of Collabra Consulting. And I have Heather Foch, founder and toner queen at Quality Imaging Solutions. So good morning, everybody. 
I think to kick off the discussion, Heather, let me start with you, because in some of our back and forth to prep for today, you had shared that you were not surprised that box checking is sort of the biggest shared risk, but you were surprised that it was as dominant as it was in the findings. Can you share why that was your initial reaction? Good morning, everybody. Um, Kelly, thank you for having me here today. Um, you know, it, it didn't surprise me when I saw that as the result, and mainly that's because of what I experienced personally, you know, as a diversified business. Um, and I can give a couple of examples. One was about even about a year ago, um, I had I already had done business with this particular federal contractor um, that was uh, on, on, a, on a DOE site, and but they, they had a parent company. So I went to the parent company's website and they had a supplier diversity whole website, you know, designed around it with, um, you know, maybe really feel like how important they took the topic. Uh, so I start filling out the form and um, partway through but the registration process, I get an automated email from someone who worked on that team um, asking me like, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, here's my number, you know, we look forward to you finishing your registration. So I get the link and I start finishing it. And one of the things they asked for were um, like my last three, three, uh, tax returns, mm. copies of those, and then copies of the, my last three financials, uh, you know, uh, you know, income statements and, um, and, uh, you know, other ones. And at that, at that point, just, just filling out to be on, on, a, on a giant list of people that they're keeping track of. Yeah. I didn't feel comfortable with giving that information out. So I emailed the person, um, asking them, Hey, this is my situation. I, and, and you couldn't finish the process without uploading those documents. It wouldn't let you finish the registration. So I emailed them, you know, explained my situation that, Hey, at this point in the process, I really don't feel comfortable with just uploading that information to you guys. There's really no reason for you to have that at this point. Um, you know, if there becomes an RFP opportunity and I get invited to that, you know, certainly that can be discussed at a later time, but I'm not just blanketly providing that information um, as I'm a private company. And what I got basically in response was that exact same automated email uh. when he introduced himself. And I'm like, okay. So I called the number and it went to what sounded like a generic voicemail box. So I just kind of figured, well, I guess there goes that registration. Well, because I had already partially started the process, once a week for maybe five weeks, I got the exact same automated email from that person. Mm -hmm. So his email address was really not being monitored. Yeah. Um, the, the phone number that was listed, you know, all of that just felt like fluff. Yeah. So it took me maybe two months for them to stop sending me those reminder emails because I never got my issue addressed and I just didn't feel comfortable with finishing the process. So I just, I stopped it, you know, 75% of the way through. Um, and that's, that I think is, is where in lies the experience that small businesses have been having yeah. over the years in trying to do business with these larger companies is maybe, you know, you are interested in, in one of their child companies, mm -hmm. but you have to go through, you know, corporate, to be registered and you go through that whole process and then nothing ever happens or you don't get the you know questions answered that you might have which is what i experienced last year and this is stuff i've seen for numerous years i, I was talking with a friend yesterday about um anniversary work anniversary dates and my 20th anniversary with my company is next april so i've, I've seen this off and on for a very long time um, so i wasn't surprised by the poll results yeah. but at the same time, I was I was shocked that even as of today that it's still yeah. that high. I mean, seventy percent. Right. Well, and Canda, let me pull you in on this because you've worked as a chief procurement officer, and this none of this is to suggest that CPOs or procurement teams are deliberately being lazy or deliberately being hands off. Right. There are so much that these teams are attempting to do at scale that as you know, from Heather's experience, we do have issues with maybe over relying on technology in the wrong way. What would you say is it about, I don't know, the structure or the operational basis of procurement teams that allows something qualitative like supplier diversity, but not contained to it, 
to sort of a backseat box check kind of status? Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Kelly. I, it's a really great question, and I think it's one that procurement leaders will um, maybe quietly or privately, lots of them admit that that they struggle with. And and I see there being a couple a couple challenges. Um, one is that um, some you know often uh, leaders, and by the way, not just in procurement, in, in a number of other disciplines uh, and functions as well, are given um, three or four objectives. And those are in addition to what they would consider to be their core objectives, mm -hmm. which for procurement, obviously, it has an operational aspect and almost always has um, a value creation or, or savings aspect. And so the procurement leader says, I've got these other either new or we'll call them what they uh, perceive as adjunct initiatives. And to be honest, a lot of times they don't have the, the, the resource, they don't have the bandwidth to, to do anything more than superficially try to address them. And, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons. The other one is that I think that often, um, particularly as it relates to supplier diversity, that that companies don't actually, and procurement leaders don't actually understand what it takes, what does good look like? And therefore, what, sh what should their program look like? They, they're given um, often you know, a, a one or two sentence um, uh, mandate, if you will, or objective. And, and without the resource and the bandwidth, they don't have the time um, often the expertise and the experience to know how do I construct a program um, that's going to achieve this. Yeah. And, and one other comment on it, I think that this, this is actually, I think, a fallacy um, for, for uh, in, in the thinking of, of certainly some procurement leaders is that they're so focused on what are the measurable deliverables i.e., you can't see my air quotes either, savings <laughs> that I have to deliver, that, they, um, that they, they lose sight of the fact that supplier diversity, that an effective supplier diversity program can actually be a huge contributor to those measurable savings, uh, value creation deliverables, but they've lost sight of that mm. or, or they can't see the forest for the trees of it. Yeah. So those are, those are just some thoughts on it. Like, yeah. No. And, and I think that's all fair. And I think the thing, you know, it's, it's not necessarily reflected directly in the results. Um, but since I know who my network is made up of, Helen, right, we always look and see who are our followers, who are we engaging with, who do we purposefully try to connect with. The vast majority of my network, who are the people who predominantly saw and participated in the poll, are people in procurement and supply chain. And so... We're the ones, in a lot of cases, on the front line, actually carrying out these initiatives. And if we're calling it a box check, would you say, Helen, are we the ones that need to change what we're doing? Or is it the mindset of the organization that procurement doesn't have the influence and the leverage to take it beyond box check status? Um, I think it might be. I'm not so sure it might be about us changing what we're doing, but it might be about our perception of how seriously the organization's taking it. And, and that might be because there's some examples of where, you know, you've tried to do something and actually the, the business has pushed back against it for whatever, for whatever reason, all, all the yeah. reasons we've spoken about on previous, uh, previous uh, live events. But I think for me, it's, it's, possibly about us being uh, perhaps a little bit cynical about it but also about wanting to change the world immediately mm. rather than um seeing uh, and i was speaking to phil uh, before we came on just about this uh, uh, seeing having a, a box to check about supplier diversity actually being a really helpful first step in making that thinking process part of how we do procurement. So you you know you start with that. You think, well, okay, I've checked my box. I've encouraged somebody to to 
um, participate or I've, I've got somebody on a very small amount of spend. It doesn't feel like I'm changing the world. But actually, from that, from starting there, you might want to click up your practice or, or the way you do things to something, you know, a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit yeah. more impactful. Um, and we certainly did that with sustainability. And I think it, you know, possibly, it, possibly it's about us, you know, being very, I don't know, idealistic about what we what we mean by supply diversity, rather than understanding how change happens and how you, you know, you do that sort of one one micro win at a time, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, and Phil, this is, I think, a great place to bring you in because of the issue of perception. Right. And and we've been we've shared this, right, like you shared it in the in the, you know, kicking off the new year letter at Art of Procurement. And we've been kind of working on it as a thread through other content. This issue that when procurement is asked what the number one roadblock or obstacle is to us being able to achieve more, we we say, well, it's how the business perceives us. How, how would you bring that idea of perception, both in terms of how the business sees us and potentially in how we and the business perceive supplier diversity and, and what is required to make it successful? How does this issue of perception become something that maybe we need to start with? You know, when I think about perception um, in the context of what we're talking about today, and especially in the context of that kind of top result that 70% feel that, you know, perhaps supply diversity programs or the worry about supply diversity programs is that is a box checking exercise. I think that perception is more from the supplier community side, you know, um, and it's understandable because I think when you go back over the past 10 years or so, it mostly has been a box checking exercise for a lot of organizations. You know, that's not a blanket statement for everybody. Sure. But I think it's fair to say a lot of companies, it was more, you know, we need to demonstrate um, to be able to get a, a government contract or um, to be in line with some regulations or whatever, that we have a percentage of spend with diverse suppliers. So that's what drove it, uh, which then created it to be this box checking exercise. You know, as, as you listen to stories like Heather went through, um, it's, you know, very easy to empathize um and say you know the experience of suppliers in dealing with supply diversity programs is that it's a box checking exercise um and that's one of the perceptions i think that we need to work hard to try and change because um certainly i've seen just in the last six months to 12 months within procurement organizations it going from being a box checking exercise to something that is far more um important to the business it's becoming top down driven whereas before when it was this box checking it was you know, we got to do it because there's a, a reason that we got to do it, you know, in terms of a deal that we're going to win or something. But now it's coming down as to, like, this is part of our values. This is part of, you know, who we want to be as a company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's driving the conversations, you know, at the budget holder level, which is where they have to be for procurement to be able to have any impact. So when I think of perceptions, I think it's more, we've got to change this perception that the suppliers have and make it more welcoming now for suppliers to, um, um, participate because it's going beyond being box checking. But on the other hand, you know, I flip it to my procurement hat. Um, you know, I've sometimes seen a perception from suppliers that are having just, just having their certificate is enough. Yes. And, um, you know, I think that kind of alluded into the second thing that you talked about, um, that it doesn't give you a, a right just having that, you know, you still need to be able to do everything that any other provider can do. Um, and you can't just over rely on, on being a diverse supplier and being a diverse supplier kind of gets a foot in the door. Yeah. And part of the challenge was, and, and why I chose to talk about these two not so secrets is that for all of the conversations I've had for this project, I can't tell you how often people say in their own words, effectively the exact same thing. And then they say, but there is no way we can talk about any of this publicly. Mm -hmm. And if we can't talk about it, we can't solve it. I mean, our language has to be respectful and the conversation has to be inclusive and we have to be careful and, and be informed and all that. Um, but if you're not talking about it, then it's, it's literally just lingering. Um, now, if five of us is a crowd, then maybe six makes a party. Um, Jason has participated in an awful lot of these discussions that I've had on on LinkedIn since since January 10th, um, and he's here and now on the speaker floor. 
Jason, let me give you the opportunity to unmute and maybe either share your reactions to the poll um, or share your thoughts about what we've discussed during this morning's audio event so far. Oh, you just have to unmute, Jason, right down the bottom of the window. Yeah, there we go. Well, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, all, and um, Kelly, thanks for having me. Of course. It, it was a thing, and uh, it's wonderful to be part of the panel here. Um, to talk about perception, that's an interesting one, because HR, the Human Resources Department, went through a very similar change in tone and uh, perception over the last 20, 30 years or so. When you consider it, you know, they used to be called the welfare officer or personnel right through to now is human resources, human capital, human resource business partners, and people capital managers. So the whole process of the human resource had to change in order for the perception to be changed. Whenever you saw someone speaking to HR today, you may think that that person's already in trouble as opposed to being, being of issued help. I think the procurement function has to go for a similar journey of maybe breaking up the roles in a way that different responsibilities lie with different individuals and therefore not any one department or so carries the can because the challenge with biodiversity is it breaks that evolves down to accountability who wants to be accountable for assigning a vendor or supplier who actually isn't capable and then uses their diverse identity as a tool to kind of explain why they were why they failed or why they were unsuccessful so i think perception is very is a key is an interesting topic to talk about but it also breaks down i guess in my view in terms of how does procurement as a function build relationships? Today, procurement is seen as someone who always asks for a discount and asks for more um, products or service and offers very little. Um, when you think about relationships, and I come from the sales side particularly, from a sales perspective, we spend time building relationships, we take clients out for dinner. When was the last time a procurement officer took a vendor out for dinner just to talk about what strategies they're going through or what they're working on for the years ahead? So those are some of the things that I think about from a perception perspective that can be done to change. I mean, working with diverse suppliers, certainly building that relationship is going to be critical to that, having that conversation. No, and I think that's an excellent call out, Jason. And I'm actually going to add a thought which will complicate all of this further. I think we have a couple of competing dynamics at play, one of which is perception, as we've been talking about, but the other is reputation, right? And this is one of the things that I know certainly anybody that I'm having regular offline conversations with, we, we have sort of this angst over the legacy procurement reputation, it's some of which definitely still exists. I'm, I'm not saying by any means that it's been eradicated. It is still a problem that at, at the end of the day, given the option of, of two things, we are probably going to move towards the one that costs less, partially because that's in our DNA and partially because it's in our performance metrics. and. We always push towards what we are um, measured by, right? So I think it, it again to me goes back to this idea of what can we talk about and how we do we talk about it? Because that perception may allow one function's reputation or one person's reputation to be brought in as sort of a silent participant into a conversation like this because people assume, which is so incredibly dangerous. Um, so we have about five minutes left on the clock for this live audio event, and, and I'm thrilled to have so many of you on the floor with me. Um, does, does anybody, you can either just unmute and jump in or, or raise your hand, totally your call. Um, but anybody that's, that's on the floor, do you want to offer sort of a, a final thought? I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to, to weigh back in here. Heather? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I def I get, uh, Philip's point about um, the perception being, you know, from the polls aspect being from the supplier side, I'm sure, you know, I, I don't know if you're able to tell exactly who um, voted in your poll to see kind of where they stand. Are they on the, the, yeah. the buy side or on the sell side? Because that would be kind of interesting too, actually. Um, and at the end of the day, for me, I know that any kind of change management does not, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? If policies are going to be changing and people are going to be taking more action on, you know, sustainability or supplier diversity, there's, there's tons of discussions that have to happen. And then a plan, you know, thought out and executed before, you know, on the supply side, we actually start to see, you know, those changes that they've made internally. Um, and on the sales side, um, it's an, a kind of an interesting 
aspect where, you know, we're, we're waiting for these things to happen. And, and I get, you know, some suppliers probably do think, oh, I've got the certification now. I'm just going to wait now for the opportunities to come rolling in. And I wonder if maybe there's an opportunity for large companies to um, maybe copy some of what government agencies do when they have certain percentages of, of diversified suppliers that they have to do business with, you know, over the year or, or within a particular contract that they're issuing, um, you know, are there opportunities where there's a prime supplier and some contractors mm -hmm. where that's how diverse suppliers can get in, you know, at working under a prime contractor, um, you know, tons of, this whole conversation is very interesting. So I'm super excited that you brought it up. Yeah. Well, and Helen, I think that's QU. So, what do you think, having been on both the public and private sides of the procurement divide, is there something that the private sector can learn from the way government regulates this kind of thing that will introduce necessary change without you know, stopping innovation or representing inappropriate government involvement in how private industry works? sure about uh you know regulation or, or or anything like that but i do think the you know back to the thing about requiring um the diverse suppliers to be considered is a really helpful way of starting the the process so it just goes back to that you know that idea of you know we've got to start somewhere and if we if we do have that as a policy that we've got to include and invite diverse suppliers and it's it's not a bad thing and and i I uh, I think that's good. I, I wanted to ask um, Jason a question, actually, if he's up for it. And it was about, um, you know, when we talk about perception, you know, one of the big challenges, I think, is there's this perception that a supplier from a diverse background is somehow not as good as anybody else. And we heard, you know, about people on one of your podcast Kelly about people being held to higher standards yes. than bigger businesses so I just wondered if you know when we talk about perception Jason do you think that's something we've got to get over that there's a perception that diverse suppliers are somehow a, a, you know a different quality I think so it's very interesting and I'll try and be quick what we have to be very careful from a procurement perspective is to not put people into boxes so uh, I interviewed once a neurodiverse individual who said, look, I'm a business owner, but although I'm autistic, I'm not going to be a mathematician. So we have to be very careful not to put people into boxes or business owners, when I say diverse identified business owners into boxes. Um, but in actual fact, uh, and also they then said, we don't want to be selected because we're diverse as well. So it's all about the trick is, and the, 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 the achievement that we can have here, where we talk, look at measuring successes, is how do we as corporates become more accessible to diverse suppliers and i think that's going to be the key uh, measure for success for all corporations where they are more accessible to diverse organizations irrespective of their diversity so when some companies are against kind of being mandated to include a diverse supplier because you may just choose the same company each and every time just to tick that box you don't want to bonus procurement professionals from having someone who's a diverse individual uh, company um, because they uh, may again just choose the right company, the right the same company each and every time just to qualify for their bonus, and that will ultimately greenwash supply diversity. Mm -hmm. So, just to be just being careful of, of that, I guess. Um, uh, and I guess you know the great thing is we over here in the UK in the EMEA region we're learning from the US, we're learning from the mistakes the US made and the successes they had, and this is really growing in prominence now over here in the UK in the EMEA region as well as Asia Pacific as well. So. We got a lot to learn to learn from our friends across the pond, um, but certainly a long way to go still. I hope that answered your question. No, I think I think that's a great thought actually to leave it on, Jason. Right here's our question: How do we become more accessible to diverse suppliers, irrespective of their diversity status? Um, and so we will certainly move on. There's four more weeks uh, in the program for creating new content. I'm positive we're going to keep discussing these things. Thank you so much to Helen, Phil, Kanda, Heather, and Jason for, for joining us here. Thank you so much to everybody that listened in. Thank you, Jonathan, for finding your, your reaction buttons. Please follow us, reach out if you want to continue the conversation. And of course, have a fantastic rest of your Friday.